Hello, I'm Natasha Hussein, and this is Newsfeed, your dose of what people are talking about online. Over the past few weeks, we've seen the all eyes on Rafah campaign spread like wildfire on social media, shining a light on the struggles of Gazans. Now, a new movement is taking center stage. This time, all eyes are on Papua, Indonesia's easternmost province. The hashtag is trending across various social media platforms and even stirring up a national debate there. The controversy centers around plans to establish massive palm oil plantations reported to be half the size of the capital, Jakarta, on the ancestral lands of the Ayu and Moy indigenous communities without their involvement or approval. A company, PT Indo Asiana Lestari, has been granted a permit to clear 36,000 hectares of forest for this project. But this move threatens the livelihoods of the indigenous people who rely on these forests for their survival. Organizations are rallying support through petitions on change.org, urging the revocation of the palm oil plantation permit. The petition highlights that protecting Papua's natural habitat is crucial not just for the local communities, but for the entire planet. By signing the petition, people worldwide can stand with the indigenous group in their fight for their homeland. On May 27th, after traveling for over 48 hours just to make their voices heard, the Ayu and Moy indigenous communities staged a peaceful protest at the Supreme Court in central Jakarta. Dressed in traditional attire, they performed prayers and rituals in front of the highest court in Indonesia. <laughs> Ini hak kami, hak mutlak. Karena tidak punya sumber kehidupan yang lain, sebab saya hidup dari tempat saya, dari tanah saya, dari alam yang ada di sana, hutan saya, itu yang saya hidup dari situ. Saya ingin karena saya tidak boleh dirampas atau diambil oleh perusahaan. Pengapaian negara terhadap kami, maka masyarakat hadat terlihat jelas dalam kasus-kasus pengambil alian dan eksploitasi kekayaan alam. Terlihat jelas. Kami tidak mau kami di- that's right, they just want to live as they always have in the forests. Papua's forests are rich in resources like wood and non-timber products vital for locals and the local economy. These forests are also a source of food and hold deep spiritual significance, forming the core of the indigenous people's identity. And as Lara explains, the implications of deforestation stretch far beyond Indonesia. Indonesia has 91 million hectares of forest, with 40% in Papua. Since 1950, more than 74 million hectares of these forests have been logged, burned, or degraded for palm oil, paper, and rubber plantations, as well as nickel mining. Adding more fuel to the fire, the latest oil palm project's deforestation is expected to release 25 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, contributing 5% to anticipated 2030 carbon emission levels. And, since Papuan jungles are home to various rare endemic species, the destruction would harm both local and global ecosystems. Experts and researchers worldwide warn that the indigenous people of Papua are enduring a tragic mix of ecocide and genocide. Absolutely is a genocide happening in West Papua. It's been happening for years. Why is this happening? Because West Papua is home to one of the world's largest gold mines. The reserves are worth an estimated $100 billion. Since the dictatorship of Indonesia's annex West Papua in 1969, it's estimated around 500,000, half a million West Papuans have been killed fighting to achieve independence. The problem is this genocide has continued for so long because there's been little to no media coverage. So like many other BIPOC people in the world whose lands are rich in resources, their lives don't matter. Their lives aren't as important. Their lives aren't worth the international community fighting for. Keep talking about Palestine, keep talking about West Papua, keep talking about the Congo. This is just the beginning. It's been a mammoth seven weeks of voting in India, and Prime Minister Narendra Modi has clinched power for a third term. But for the first time in a decade, his once powerful party, the BJP, has lost its parliamentary majority. The opposition is also celebrating after making significant strides. 
642 million Indians went to the polls, and this is how their votes will shape the new parliament. On its own, Modi's BJP scored 240, short of an outright majority in parliament. But it's their alliance with the National Democratic Alliance that secured a governing majority of 293 seats and the third BJP-led government. The opposition-led alliance made an impressive comeback, securing 232 seats, spurred by a surge in support for the Indian National Congress, led by Rahul Gandhi. A myriad of other parties will take up the remaining 18 seats. The results have not only surprised the ruling party, pollsters were also caught off guard. We'll have Pradeep with us. You know, the good thing is he's being magnanimous. He's apologized for the error. And the fact is, and unlike Rajdeep, I don't believe that the channels have nothing to do with it. It's a team. It's a partnership. So we got this wrong. Uh, make no mistake about yeah. that. But, you know, he worked really hard. Four times he went and did this poll. So we thank you for your effort. Thank you. And you win some and you lose some. He still has a fabulous track record Are in Pradeep terms of don't. polling. Now you made him a god. I'm no, but, but the thing is, listen. Are you get it all well. No, no, here, 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 right, Pradeep, right, come right. on. Gosh, I hope Pradeep is okay. These things happen. Um, we can't always get it right. Well, Smita is in New Delhi and says coalition politics spell exciting times for Indians as more checks and balances can make the world's biggest democracy more robust. Well, the long-drawn electoral process that lasted for more than six weeks uh, finally has ended. We know the results and they have thrown up very interesting political scenarios. The BJP at the moment standing at 240 seats of the 543 seats in Parliament. This essentially means that the BJP is short of at least 32 seats in reaching that magic number of 272. So while Narendra Modi looks all set to come back as Prime Minister for a third term, he'll only be, of course, the first leader since the 60s, uh, you know, the first government which will have a third consecutive run and Narendra Modi will be the first non-Congress leader to be Prime Minister for the third term but it will not be an easy task for him because he's not used to really working with coalition partners and in this case there are two key regional allies the Janata Dal United and the Telugu Desham Party in the South that could you know emerge as king makers and if they have a change of heart if they in fact choose to switch over their allegiance to the opposition alliance which has performed way better than was projected in the exit poll and they're very upbeat about it. You could really see very interesting, fluid political scenarios here. But moving forward, if the DJP stays put with its alliance partners, it also means that the plans and proposals that Mr. Narendra Modi had, including a one nation, one election, or rolling out the uniform civil code, uh, the several legislations that would have to be put on hold. But overall, people, of course, on social media, we've been seeing, they've been saying that this is a very healthy check and balance for a democratic process. Uh, people, some of them saying that we are being able to breathe now, that it's good to be back to the coalition era instead of being under a government with a brute majority that wasn't really listening into others and was criticized for acting upon dissenters and critiques. To France, where Prime Minister Gabriel Attal is being accused of mansplaining and manterrupting. That's when a man explains something or interrupts a woman in a condescending manner. Only that, in this case, Attal made a surprise appearance and interrupted a radio debate while his fellow party member Valerie Heyer was speaking. He wasn't meant to be there in the first place, and his presence has been interpreted as trying to undermine Heyer, a candidate for the upcoming European Parliament in elections. The incident happened while she was taking part in a debate with other lead candidates. This is not the first time such accusations against Atal have been made. He was previously accused of undermining the head of his party when he took part in another debate last month. Following a lot of backlash online, with many people calling out Atal for sexism and mansplaining, Heyer actually took to X to defend the PM. Instrumentalizing the feminist cause only harms it. Real sexism is thinking for me. Because I am a woman, would I necessarily be made invisible by the presence of a man? Proud that Gabriel Atal is committed to my side in this campaign. Ooh, awkward. All right, on to something less awkward. A new era in Turkish football has begun. Jose Mourinho, one of the game's most colorful and entertaining characters, has officially started life as the new coach of Istanbul team Fenerbahce. Mourinho has some big goals for Feder and hopes him at the helm will bring more eyes on the Turkish league. Robin takes a look at his highly anticipated arrival in Turkey and how it's played out on social media. Your dreams are now my dreams. The words of one Jose Mourinho, the newly installed Fenerbahce boss. 
the former Porto, Inter Milan, Chelsea, Real Madrid, Manchester United, Tottenham and Roma manager wasted no time in turning on the charm. And I promise you that from this moment I belong to your family. This shirt is my skin. Fans say they are over the moon. Mourinho has decided to come to Fener. I'm really excited to see his reactions because he is well known for them. Whether that is celebrating a goal or ignite fans or responding to a bad call from the referee. I'm excited to see Instagram reels of Mourinho. We're really happy, we're really hopeful. We believe that the team will accomplish great things this season and other seasons to come with Mourinho. Mourinho's arrival in Istanbul nearly broke the internet. The man popularly known as the special one had a marked effect on social media users in Turkey. In fact, Fenerbahce's welcome video posted on X had nearly two and a half million views in the first few hours that it was up. The live stream of Mourinho being presented to his new fan base topped two million views. Even local journalists couldn't get enough of the 61-year-old. My wish is that Turkish football improves at every level. My wish is that Turkish Super League is getting better all the time. Mourinho has always been an entertaining character. He's delivered some gems in his press conferences in his career. Here's a list of some of his most memorable quotes. I won't say that we have to win. I won't put that pressure, but we can't lose. It's not important how we play. If you have a Ferrari and I have a small car to beat you in a race, I have to break your wheel and put sugar in your tank. And who can forget this one? Please don't call me arrogant, but I'm European champion and I think I'm a special one. Special times ahead, it would seem. Welcome to Istanbul, Jose. And the latest celebrities to go green are none other than Coldplay. The band's latest world tour called The Music of Spheres has left many praising its impact in the fight against the climate crisis. Sustainability, to be specific, in a statement on their website, the British group said they've cut their carbon footprint by more than half after two years of touring. This is in part thanks to some creative methods and their fans who chose recyclable LED, LED wristbands instead of lighting their phones, which are powered by electricity. Also, and brilliantly, they generated electricity using kinetic dance floors. How does that work, you wonder? Well, this is how they look and work. Each tile has a generator built in that is activated by human movement. So when fans walk, dance, or jump, electricity is generated. Also, instead of fancy planes or private jets, as many musicians are known for, Coldplay opted to take the train instead. That's commitment way beyond the stage. One of them is to plant trees where we still have um, a big carbon footprint in some areas. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. So will will you be doing this in every country? Yeah. Well, well no, we, we're working with uh, two organizations in the world and wherever they plant trees, you know, it's a, a thing called One Tree Planted. Yeah. They, they have a big thing. And then that's just one. We have a lot of different projects within the tour. All right, we've always kept you up to date on data breaches on social media platforms, but this time it's a cyber attack on TikTok. Several brands and celebrities have been affected after hackers sent malicious links through private messages to hijack their profiles. Among them, news network CNN and reality TV star Paris Hilton. TikTok says the number of accounts compromised is very small and it's working with the affected users to restore access to their accounts. However, there's been no details on how the cyber attack was carried out. This latest incident comes as TikTok's future in the U.S. remains in limbo. The U.S. government wants TikTok to be sold by its Chinese parent company ByteDance within a year or face a national ban. Meanwhile, one online personality is thriving. Mr. Beast is now the most subscribed YouTuber in the world, overtaking Indian music label T-Series. Mr. Beast now has a whopping 272 million followers on his YouTube account, which he has grown thanks to massive giveaways and crazy stunts like burying himself alive. T-Series, which uploads music videos and trailers, has held the top spot for five years, is now in second position with 266 million subscribers.
Mr. Beast's real name, Jimmy Donaldson, is only 26 years old. In 2022, Forbes estimated his net worth to be around half a billion dollars. Wow. And in 2023, Forbes ranked him first in a ranking of top 50 creators globally. On Saturday, news that he's the most subscribed YouTuber led to a record-breaking 2 new million users subscribing to his channel. With almost 800 posts in 12 years, Mr. Beast has kept his followers literally on the edge of their seats with his near-death experience videos. This latest one has already got more than 77 million views and over 4 million likes. I just dropped these two strangers off in the middle of the wilderness. These two guys have never met each other in their entire lives. Nice to meet you, man. Every day the two of you survive in this wilderness, I'll give you $10,000. Hope you bought enough money, man. We're here for the long run. Ooh, not for the faint-hearted. And that's our show. Find our latest stuff on YouTube and do subscribe to our channel. See you soon.